Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the show today, we've got David Joyce, a candidate for the Yuba County Board of Supervisors uh, this June, and Fred Rouse, winemaker from El Dorado. And speaking of El Dorado, that's where, we, where I ran into you the first time, David. You yeah. were at a, a Libertarian Meet the Candidates meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's where I met you. Uh, and you are now running for the nonpartisan race, right, of uh, yes. Yuba County Board of Supervisors. Why? Uh, the big thing for me, as far as the reasons why, um, my wife and I, we moved back up to the Yuba County area. I was stationed at Beale Air Force Base uh, from 04 to 07. Uh, and we moved up there from Citrus Heights. And there's certain things in government that uh, we're, we're used to. Citrus Heights is actually a really well-run city. They have a surplus budget. And when we got there, a lot of the things that we started to see just seemed out of place. And one of the things that happened was I started to really – look in and start digging deeper into things and the more and more I found the more and more I didn't like and it became in a lot of ways a rabbit hole and it was one of these things where you know I've been involved in politics for over a decade and I really started seriously thinking about running because we love our neighborhood we love our house like and I honestly felt like everybody just deserved better what they were getting and um, for me one of the things I did was uh, there's two things in politics that I learned the hard way one, you don't ever run for office um, unless your family is behind you and supports you. So that was something that I made sure my family was supportive of it. The second thing is uh, you got to, and I think a lot of people make this mistake on a lower level, but also on a higher level, you got to consult people that will tell you the truth, that are experienced and uh, know what's going on. So I, I called a good solid eight to 10 people that I had crossed paths with. Uh, locally in Yuba County in politics, but also too in Sacramento and, and pretty much all through Northern California that I'd met. And the response from every one of them was overwhelmingly positive. So it, it really kind of catapulted me to try to, to, to go ahead and do this. So. When, when, did you, uh, when did you start? When did you make the decision? How long have you been campaigning? Uh, in my heart, the decision was made in November. My wife uh, in December, you know, she said we're all in. So it was around right around Christmas time, it was right right then that we started doing it. And uh, shortly afterwards, right after New Year's, I pulled signatures in lieu, and I've been pounding doors ever since. And every day is a lot of uh, a lot of nuts and bolts in the campaign, but every day is something productive, and everything's moving forward. And one of the things I've learned, uh, one of the things that I, I've noticed in this campaign, there's two really good things that have happened. One, all the goodwill and all the people I've helped before or all the, the things I've done for people in the past, there's been a, just an avalanche of those people coming back and helping me out. Uh, the second thing was every single campaign that I've worked on, win, lose, or draw, I've been really blessed that I think I've learned something on every single campaign. Well, speaking of campaigns you've worked on, you've been uh, on the Central Committee in Sacramento. You've yes. been, uh, uh, worked for Tom McClintock. Yes. Uh, and, uh, so I guess that, that puts you in the Republican camp. Are you? But this is a nonpartisan race. How are you registered, Republican I, or Libertarian? I, I switched from Republican to Libertarian about three, four years ago. Um, I'm a, the thing, though, with the Libertarians, though, is I tell people I'm a very different brand. I, 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 Matt Kibbe, I, I saw a video the other day of Matt Kibbe where he said he was politically homeless. And I said I can relate because I'm a very socially conservative libertarian. So like, so a little bit. Of, I, I tell people, you know, I do really well with the libertarians. I do really well with the Republicans too because I'm kind of a hybrid. So and it's one of those things where when I go door to door, and I knock on people's doors, especially like the Republicans or really conservative independents, they say, "Well, you're a libertarian." They're like, "What does that mean?" And I think they're trying to test me. Uh, are you Gary Johnson or you Rand Paul? And I say to them, "Here's the thing." I said politically. If you took Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, and Rand Paul and put them in a blender, that's pretty much who I am. So, so, so it's one of those things that it's it's worked really, really well. Uh, the reception going in a nonpartisan race, going to door as a libertarian, every single person hears you. And let me let me ask you, what's the uh, what's the voter registration uh, in your in your district? The voter registration, uh, it's traditionally a low turnout. There's 5,500 and change registered realistically there's probably about 3,000 but the last two elections 3,000 that actually get, get to that the polls. actually uh, get to the polls but then the last two elections have been pretty low they've been you know the 1200 1400 range for county supervisor okay now but and what's the ratio Democrat Republican independent libertarian it's it's a very purple district um, one of the things that a lot of people have warned warned me out was it's very um, uh, purple but I, the thing is, at the end of the day, at a county level, one By thing... By purple, that, you mean split between Democrats yeah, and Republicans? Yeah, it's, it's split. There's a lot of independents. Mm -hmm. um, 
The independents are kind of a mixed bag. Uh, you have to kind of meet them and talk to them face to face. A lot of AIP, uh, very angry ex-Republicans that are very conservative, but they're just registered AIP. Um, one of the things that I've noticed though too is, you know, when people say, oh, it's a purple district, when it comes to the issues, when you get down to that county level, a lot of the social issue stuff goes out the window and everybody wants the same three or four things. So like I have a lot of Democrat support and, and I'm do, doing fantastic with the independents. Are you planning on uh, knocking on pretty much every door in the district? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Personally? Yep, yep, absolutely. And, okay, and how, how many of you uh, canvassed so far? I'd say right now we're, we're easily like six to 800 okay. around there. Like we're, we're, we're definitely getting out there and you know doing a lot of the doors and stuff. Uh, the thing I do too though is that um, I try to blend a lot of different campaign styles where, uh, a prime example of this, my wife and I, I have a really good friend of mine here in Sacramento and I went to go talk to him about the campaign and he gave me fantastic advice. He said, David, he goes, all you have to do is show people your heart and you'll win, right? So the thing is, he said, I said, well, what do you mean show them your heart? He goes, tell your wife, you guys open up your home, invite your neighbors to come over, do pizza parties, get them to, all you have to do is get them in your house, in your environment and, and talk to them and you'll win, right? So I, I mentioned it yesterday in an event that I went to and people went crazy. And it's just one of those things where we do those little type of things where the traditional knocking of the doors, there's other ways to get a hold of people. So I do a lot of like coffee. Um, I go to like, you know, it's just meeting people at where they're comfortable. You know, so a lot of people util utilizing social media, one thing I've been very effective at is that on social media, uh, a lot of people have just invited me to come to their house. You know, seven o'clock at night, sit down at the table, David, let's break bread, you know. And you know, when a person not only supports you, but gives you a check unsolicited, it's the best feeling in the world. So are you getting people that will not only say, come over and have dinner with us, but I'll bring my friends and neighbors as well? We're, we're getting to that point. We're, we're really, um, initially when I was doing the signatures in lieu, I, I, I knew I was gonna need to raise money. Um, my wife and I both too, we really felt so strongly about it that we're gonna loan the campaign a significant amount of money. But um, it's one of these things where, uh, Signature and loot time, I wasn't asking for a ton of money, but now we're, we're starting to really ramp that up and I'm getting a lot of people asking about that and doing events and all that stuff. How, how much money is your, is your incumbent uh, opponent spending? Uh, last time he ran, it, it, typically in a Yuba County race uh, for that size, the districts are really small. So typically a, a, an incumbent or someone running for office will be anywhere from 20 to 30. But the thing with the 20 to 30 though, there's a lot of dead wood within that 20 to 30. So it's like, I think realistically, if you spend the money the right way, 10, 15, you can win. In so, other words, not a lot of overhead, not a lot of wasted money. No, no, no. If you, you, there's a, there's, out of the 30, if you, if you raise 30 grand and you compare it and look at the filings and what they're spending it on, I think you can shave an easy 10 or $5,000 right off the top. And the, you're, so, on, you're on track to, uh, to raise your, your 15 uh, grand? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to 15. So it's one of those things where I, you know, the one thing I tell people when it comes to the fundraising part is the more resources you have, the, the stronger you become. So it's one of these things where I don't turn people away either because it's like, hey, if you, you know, give me X, Y, Z or whatever, um, then I can, you know, pay people to walk a district. It's a whole different story than, than volunteers and all that stuff, you know? So what are the issues that people are telling you that they care about that they're not satisfied that the incumbent is taking care of? Uh, my number one thing that I realized um, that really helped my campaign, I grew up in Boston. Um, and when I was a teenager, there were, um, tons of shootings in like the late, uh, uh, early 90s actually. And my parents were really big on me reading. So every single day, we'd have the Boston Herald, Boston Globe on the paper on the table. Every single day there was a shooting. We were like South Side Chicago, it was terrible, right? So uh, William Bratton took over as the police chief, implemented Broken Window, and I to this day think he saved our city. And he went down and worked for um, Rudy Giuliani and, and when he was mayor and basically flipped New York too. And now he has a, a, a position with the White House. Um, but basically, one of the things I started talking about was broken window theory. Broken window theory, and in particular, like the Peachtree Mall area is in my district. And that place has been a disaster for 30 years. Um, the second I started talking about that, it really resonated with everyone. So it was something that, you know, it's been a boiling pot for over 30 years. But then when I started talking about the, di the deeper issues of Broken Window and you know something that's picking up the garbage and I explained the whole theory, people have been incredibly receptive. Uh, the second thing- So you're just, you're just talking about basic government services. Law enforcement. Law. Yeah, tightening down on law enforcement. Tightening down on law enforcement, but there's also there's Yuba County, the two things that Yuba County that I, I find is a challenge, Yuba County has a historical um, 
perception of having a really bad budget managing and constantly being in debt and you know one of the worst uh, funded counties in California or whatever. Uh, but the second thing is there's there's just layers of apathy. So it's one of these things where you know you take garbage on the side of the road and it'll just sit there for two weeks where Citrus Heights or Roseville or someplace, that type of behavior is just not tolerated. So I think I've really heard a nerve with people talking about that. Um, the second thing that has been really big issue is uh, our particular county board of supervisors does their meetings at seven, uh, nine o'clock in the morning on Tuesdays. And the water board meetings, they also serve in the water board. They're, they're pretty much right afterwards. And to me, that's avoiding the public because there's only a certain amount of people that can make a meeting at, at uh, nine o'clock on a Tuesday. So I've been a staunch proponent of changing the times to seven o'clock at night. And that has really resonated with people too, because so you're, I, you're running a fill the pothole campaign. Yeah, <laughs> sort of. But it's one of those things where, um, you know, it's just just simple things that I think that everybody across the board wants. Mm -hmm. And when I start talking about them, I was at an event yesterday, and someone said, "Why should I volunteer six hours for you?" I said, "Do you want things to keep going the way they're going?" I said, "You, it's not your fault the way things are." I said, "The only problem is you haven't had an elected official with conviction." to talk about these things. They said, the way we have technology and social media now, I said, we can't ignore issues anymore because people can't run from them. I was like, so the things that are happening, whether it's changing the Board of Supervisors meetings, uh, transparency with our budgeting, we have a huge scandal with our water agency where they're borrowing money back and forth. Those are the type of things that when I'm an elected official, I can publicly talk about those things every single day and rally people to that cause and put pressure and kind of crystallize public opinion where those things, people are forced to make a decision on and either fix them or they get outed for being part of the problem. Now, I, I know that, uh, well, maybe maybe uh, national issues do become part of a, a county supervisor campaign. I'm guessing probably not. Yeah. But we like to talk about them on this show, so sure. I'm, I'm gonna bring up one, mm -hmm. uh, which is the uh, Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, has uh, released uh, this year's Worldwide Threat Assessment, which, uh, again, says that Iran remains the most prominent state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, is that something that either one of you agree with? Uh, I would say one of the things for me, uh, having a military background, um, I, I think I look through things with a little bit of a different lens when it comes to this. I think that Iran uh, certainly is a sponsor of terror. I think that's been documented over and over again. But I don't think we have a particular leader in that. I, I quite frankly don't trust several countries. And I, I kind of come from that Rand Paul model of, you know, if these countries are sponsoring terrorism and they don't like us, let's shut off our funding. So you could, off the top of my head, I can, I can name Iran, North Korea, I don't trust Cuba, uh, Venezuela. I mean, there's, there's a laundry list. I just, I just don't think that it's almost like a totem pole. Like, and I, I don't think that we can necessarily say, oh, Iran's number one right now because Russia might be one. I, I heard on the way over here today that Russia was talking about a unstoppable nuclear weapon that they're trying to work on. So I think that changes with those cast of characters every other day. So I, on the other hand, um, think that our government has documented and reported in numerous instances since um, we went to war against Al Qaeda in 2001 that all of the major terrorist organizations that are of concern to us, with the exclusion of Hamas and Hezbollah, um, well, Hamas is actually Sunni. They're all Sunnis, um, and Iran is a Shiite country, um, and Hezbollah is a Shiite organization. They're actually at war with the same terrorists that we, our government, has labeled as the most significant terrorist threats to the West and to the rest of the world, and that would include ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Nus Nusra Front, most, most of whom, most of those organizations are sponsored by us, the U.S., and our allies in the Middle East, and primarily um, UAE, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. I think it's pretty clear that in the last couple years, Saudi Arabia has been the biggest state sponsor of terror, certainly if you consider the war in Syria, the civil war in Syria, um, as a result of terrorism, terrorists backed by other nations trying to depose Assad, who is an Alawite, it's a, a sect, a, um, a type of Shia Islam. So there's plenty of countries that we consider allies. 
um, that have sponsored much more terror than Iran has. Now, Iran does, I, I, I would assume, if, if I was Iranian and we went to war, the United States went to war on my eastern flank in Afghanistan and built a bunch of bases, and on my western flank in Iraq and built a bunch of bases, and for years, the American media has been telling us, oh, look at those people, death to America, death to America, they hate us, they hate us. Well, they've never done anything to us, really. Um, but if I was Iran, I'd be a little concerned about um, being invaded, being bombed, um, about aggressive actions from United States. And you think that there might be a, a reason for the Iranians to... Uh, be somewhat defensive in, uh, oh, in politics? Oh, more than a, I think the reason is obvious. I mean, I think that our media is filled with messages, which I would characterize as propaganda, um, that Iran represents a threat to the United States. Now, Iran may represent a threat to Israel, um, especially if Israel were to take aggressive action against Iran. I yeah, would say well, I would that say, would be a problem for Israel. Wouldn't you say that any Arab nation in the Middle East would be a threat to Israel, given half a chance? Sunni, yeah. uh, Shiite, any of them? Yeah, no no other nation at this point has invaded Israel. However, Israel has invaded Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. So yeah, I would say that um, there's some mutual animosity between and Israel the, the and all of its neighbors. The larger question to me is why in the world, I mean, it's basically a, a Shia, Sunni, Jewish conflict. The, and they all hate each other. They're all essentially from the same tribal stock, if you want to go back a millennia, but they all hate each other because they have different interpretations of uh, Holy Scriptures or something. But why is it the United States battle at all? Now, I recognize that we buy oil from them, but it, after all, is their oil, and they have the right to sell it or not, we don't have the right to defend our right to buy. We don't have a right to buy. I agree. And I think the assumption of the powers that be, um, and that would include our military, our, um, our resource industry, our multinational resource companies, um, and most of our politicians of both the major parties, assume that those resources are indeed ours. And I do believe that our projection of power, I think it's hard to deny that our projection of power is for the reason of democracy pr promotion or some other line of garbage that we choose to believe. I think it's clearly an attempt to control and dominate the resources. Well, and I, think it's, I think it's that and one other thing. I think it's for the health and, and, and feeding of the defense industry. They well, need to keep a continual war going, otherwise they lose the contracts. Right. And it is, I mean, the, the defense industry is a significant portion of our national expenditures and there's defense, there's not only um, direct spending on military bases and, and military support, but there are all of these um, companies, the Lockheed Martins and the Boeings and the Raytheons and the Northrop Grumman's and go on down the list. Yeah, it's a military industrial security intelligence complex. Right, and, and all of the intelligence too, right. Um, they all, they've dispersed that, they've peppered it throughout various congressional districts and states all over the country so that um, it's a, it's, it is a form of, um, yeah, people feel connected to it, their jobs depend on it, their livelihoods depend on it. Well, we've so. certainly kept the hornet's nest alive since 2001 and, and actually before in the Middle East, and now it looks like the Trump administration is trying to stir up another hornet's nest in North Korea. Now, I think most people would agree that North Korea, for all of its bombast, doesn't have, even though they did have a nuke, would not have the ability to do any significant damage to the United States without getting annihilated themselves, and mm -hmm. I doubt they're going to do that. That being the case, why is Trump stirring the hornet's nest uh, in North Korea to the extent that uh, Joseph Yoon, the uh, U.S. Department, uh, State Department Special Envoy to North Korea, has seen fit to resign. Yeah, it's hard to imagine because, um, because we, it, it's pretty well acknowledged that if we were to, if I even a low-level contract, what do they call it, a, a, a dirty, a dirty face attack. Oh, there's bloody, bloody, bloody nose, bloody the nose. bloody nose attack. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, that would quickly escalate. And if I think China has committed that if we initiate hostilities, armed hostilities, 
that they will get involved on the side of North Korea. And so maybe, I mean, really, geopolitically, economically, our biggest rival is China. Um, and maybe it's a, a way to create a mess on China's border that will require a tremendous amount of their effort and resources to keep a lid on or cap or whatever. Maybe it's just a way to you mess mean it's with China. an anti-competitive trade uh, effort? Or something. To, you have a military to, background, uh, David. Uh, Air Force. Yes. Um, Way in. Uh, well, the, with the North Korean issue, I honestly think a lot of it uh, stems back to Trump reestablishing the U.S.'s place in the world. I think. And what place is that? Well, I think that I think it's one of these things where people perceived us as being weak after Obama, and so one of these things where, for for better or for worse, I think we're trying to regain. Where we we used to be, because I think I think we've globally gone through a huge transition. If you look at where we were at with uh, Bush forty three to Obama to Trump, and it's just three different flavors. So it was one of those things where I think with Trump though too, I think there's a extent that he does think the tr the threat is real, um, but also too like he was saying with China, China has to factor into that somehow because they're well, not to mention South Korea and Seoul would be yes. the uh, the the, uh, the city which yeah. would lose most of its population if uh, there were hostilities. Probably. One thing that I, I find though too though is like the people with the military background. I think you know we look at it through a different lens. Where like I don't get into a lot of the emotional knee jerk stuff. I think a lot of people get into. So when it comes to the actual an exchange, like a, a if we had gotten to a conflict with them, I always tell people. I said you know the average American talks out, talks that way from a defensive standpoint, like we're not gonna fight back or something, right? And I said, going back to the defense contracts, I said, do you think that Lockheed Martin and all these things that like, we don't have missile defense that you know, is classified or whatever? I said, but also too, if you try, you know, one of the things that I've told people from the start with the Korea situation, Japan is going to be the key. Because I think that Japan, even though their uh, policy is not to have nuclear weapons, they are defensed by the United States. If something happens and they lift a finger towards Japan, that gives us carte blanche with all those mir uh, naval carriers off the coast to take them out. So and one of the things I tell people, I said, you have to think out, out of not a defensive strategy, but an offensive strategy, what we're able to do. And, and one of the things that I, I brought up with a friend of mine the other day, we're, we brought up Ed Snowden and we said, hey, Ed Snowden, for all his, whether people like, dislike, whatever, he's a controversial person, right? The one thing he I did- I think he's a hero, but go on. Well, Ed, Ed Snowden, the one thing he did was he exposed that some of the technological reality that was sci-fi is actually happening. So if someone came up to me 20 years ago and said, hey, your phone's gonna record you or your television's record you, they would have been institutionalized, right? I bring that up because it, 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 to emphasize a point that like we have Area 51, we have Lockheed, all these people. If Ed Snowden knew that the phones were recording us, what don't what do we have for North Korea that no one knows about? That's what I, that's what I, I you know I tell people you should sleep easy at night because there's a lot of people with a lot of vested interests to make sure that this country stays safe. So I I, I try to side on on an offensive mindset rather than a defensive and for whatever reason whenever people talk about north korea or whatever they they chicken little kind of sets in i think a little bit and they they talk from a defensive standpoint defense go ahead oh uh, well i was just going to say I, yeah i come from i don't have a military background mm -hmm. and um as a libertarian and i think really the success of the libertarian party politically on a national level in the future will depend on um, distinguishing ourselves from the two major parties, which mm -hmm. seem to be both very militarist and very um, aggressive in projecting American power and um, talking tough and um, around the world. And I think people are kind of looking more skeptically at that. Um, back to Edward Snowden, I mean, I would go so far that I've seen realistic explanations from people that are ex-CIA that have said, you know, maybe this is all a big psyop. Most of what he put out there really was already known by people in the know. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, there were several other whistleblowers that were punished for releasing the kind of stuff he did. And granted, he's in Syria, and we went through all the motions of chasing him down Russia. across country and all this stuff. But, I mean, the purpose, what would be the purpose of a psyop like Edward Snowden? It would be to... You know, to tell to it's most of this stuff that the CIA does 
is not to spy on other countries. It's to control what the American people think. I mean, if you ask me, I would say most of the major media, Operation Mockingbird never ended. I mean, what you read in the newspapers today about Russia or Iran or North Korea is propaganda from the military industrial complex and the intelligence community that is targeted at taxpayers, citizens of the United States to make us afraid, to make us afraid not only of North Korea and Venezuela, for God, why would we be afraid of, Ven I mean, come on, Cuba, why would I care, why would, why would I be afraid of Cuba? Um, you know, and Iran and Russia and China, of course, um, but to be afraid of our government too. I mean, it's necessary that we be very concerned, that we all stay in line, that we don't speak um, truth to power, that we don't question what we're and being told. And that the Lockheeds and the Grumman's and the, uh, the rest of the defense keep industry getting keep their... getting well fed. Right. So I'm just, I, I have no reason at this point in my life, based on what I know about the CIA since it was founded in the late 1940s, and um, all of its operations in Central America and Southeast Asia and the Middle East and the United States, um, testing of biological war, implementing biological warfare in the Korean War in the early 50s, testing biological warfare agents on the U.S. population. This is all, I mean, this is all out there. Um, questions about the Kennedy assassination, questions about 9-11, which I happen to believe the official version of 9-11 is obviously false. If Building 7 collapsed onto its own footprint, it wasn't hit by an airplane, clearly it was pre-planted with explosives. Well, if it was pre-planted with explosives, look at how those other towers just exploded outward. Just look at it. They exploded outward. Anyway, um, why would I believe anything that the government or the mainstream media tells me about anything? I don't think it's healthy. So Vote Libertarian, it's the skeptic's choice. Thank you yes. very much. We'll see you again <laughs> next week, same time, same place. I'm the Libertarian Counterpoint, www.accesssacramento.org, Channel 17 in Sacramento, cable channels all over the place, and on YouTube and also on Facebook at the Libertarian Counterpoint page. Thank you.